conference. And we're going to start the day with an authority in epidemiology, it's Professor uh, Mirna Weisman. Professor Mirna Weisman is at the Department of Psychiatry and Public Health at the Columbia University. Professor, it's an honor having you here, and we are very pleased to be here today, this morning. Okay, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Jair Mir and the organizers of Why Mind and the students who listened to us and let us criticize them. It's really been a wonderful experience and very impressive. Uh, I'm glad, I hope you're glad you invited an epidemiologist. These are the people who I work with now on this project. It's, uh, it's the key people, there's lots of other people, and it's a very multilingual and multicultural uh, staff of people. I'm going to talk about major depression in our family study, but I'm mostly going to talk about how we move from the bedside to the bench and what that means. Translational research now generally refers to knowledge generated by advances in the basic sciences. You learn about Drosophila and move to drugs and then into policy. Uh, it's translated into new approaches for prevention, diagnosis, and treatment, and it's supposed to be followed by innovations in clinical practice and health policy. That's really not the way it works. Uh, the translational research has a high priority. Uh, there's a new journal, the, there's a new institute, there's a road map, these are all in the United States. But even in Europe, translational research was the centerpiece of the European Commission health budget. It's also translational, it's a key word you see in funding and in grants uh, submitted to for funding agencies. And this is the definition of translational research in psychiatry. And this comes directly from an Institute of Medicine report. Translation of discoveries from the basic sciences, again back to Drosophila or C. elegans, uh, into new diagnostic and preventive interventions, including identifying high-risk individuals and testing methods of intervention. And the second stage is clinical developments into comparative effectiveness, et cetera. I think that this is lost in translation, if any of you saw this wonderful movie. If you look outside of psychiatry, there are some classic examples where the research moved from the bedside or the population to the bench. Uh, there's smoking that was associated with lung cancer, has had a major impact in public health, after this observation was made by an epidemiologist in a large survey, it led to animal studies, gene expression studies, studies of the effects of passive smoking, et cetera, et cetera, and also to policy. Uh, lipid levels predicted cardiac events in a longitudinal study that led to animal studies. Uh, people were changing their diets before the mechanism of this, action, of this observation was really understood. And then one wonderful example of translational epidemiology comes from Eric Kandel, a Nobel Prize winner, uh, and his wife, Denise Kandel, and Amir Levine. Denise had been doing epidemiologic studies, surveys of drug use in the United States for years, and she showed that cigarettes and alcohol were gateway drugs to marijuana cocaine. The conventional wisdom was that um, uh, adolescents, children adolescents would start smoking early and that led them because of social factors onto marijuana, etc. However, uh, Kandel and Kandel and Levine decided to test that using animal models and they provided the first molecular explanation for the gateway sequence using a novel mouse model. 
Nicotine, they showed, causes changes in the brain that make it more vulnerable to cocaine, and pretreatment with nicotine altered response to cocaine in the mice by changes in synaptic strength in a brain region, which was critical to addiction. Denise then went back to her epidemiologic studies, and she also showed that cocaine users started to use cocaine only after they had begun to smoke and while they were still active smokers. Now that's not proof, but it certainly is the beginning to understand the mechanism of an epidemiologic observation. So I'm going to t take you through how we, where we've been going with the work on depression in families. Uh, epidemiology is an, ep is an observational science. It generates hypotheses, identifies risk factors, but it can't alone decipher etiologic mechanisms. The findings can be tested, though, in more tract tractable experimental approaches in clinical or the basic sciences. And we heard some very marvelous examples yesterday in some of the talks and in Joan Kaufman's talk, uh, her short course, course on epigenetics. So let me begin by the epidemiologic observations. In the 1970s, the conventional wisdom was that depression was a disorder of menopausal women and that it did not occur in children. And in fact, there was an NIH conference about this that uh, looked at whether there could be depression in children because the belief was that they did not have sufficient ego development. And the conclusion of the conference was that childhood depression rests largely on surmise. In the 1980s, there was a revolution in psychiatric epidemiology, and the first large-scale community-based surveys were undertaken. And these surveys were important because they used criteria that were similar as had been used in clinical research and practice. They used those in the community surveys. In other words, they weren't just studying unhappiness or wellness. They studied actual psychiatric disorders. And they came up with a lot of findings that are now considered uh, accepted and appear in textbooks and nobody questions much of it. These were followed in the 1990s by much better studies. The ECA was the first, but these were far better studies and uh, they were also cross-national studies and probably some of you have participated in Ron Kessler's uh, International Consortium in Psychiatric Epidemiology, which has 30 countries. And in the uh, two, 2000s, this work continued. In the United States, there was an underrepresentation of Latinos, blacks, and Asians in the early studies, and they did studies that focused specifically on these groups by oversampling. And then the NESARC, which was funded by the Alcohol Institute in the United States and has 45,000 people. I think it's the largest one ever done. Now, uh, this is a little bit provincial because I do know that there have been excellent surveys that are begun and ongoing in the Netherlands and in uh, Australia and New Zealand. The most important finding from our point of view of these studies was this, the age-specific rates of major depression. And what we saw here is that the age of onset of depression was not in the menopausal years. That doesn't mean that women who were menopausal didn't get depressed, but that was a recurrence rather than a f the onset. But the onsets were rare before puberty and began to rise steeply around age 13 to 15, and these were the peak ages of onset. So, as an epidemiologist who's interested in prevention, and how do you do prevention? It's by trying to understand what are the precursors of the onset. So we began family high-risk studies. We argued that if this is a disorder that began early in adolescence, and we knew it was familial from work done by Elliot Gershon and people in Iowa, we knew that we would probably find high rates of depression in the offspring of depressed parents. So we began almost 30 years ago. It was one of the first studies I did, um, a high-risk study. 
and this is the study. It's still going on. We're in our sixth wave. And I'll show you how we progress from epidemiology to trying to understand mechanisms. It was a high-risk study. We had probands who began, who were coming to the Depression Research Unit at Yale and had moderate to severe uh, major depression, but they were mostly ambulatory, but not psychotic. And then we took probands who came from our, the epidemiologic catchment area study, so they came from the same community, and on three or four occasions we had interviewed them and we knew that they had no psychiatric disorders. So we got a proband, that's generation one now, and the spouse, and we interviewed all the children, and we did the same thing in the low-risk group. And then as the children got older, we, inter we interviewed their spouse. And then as time went on and funding continued, we interviewed the grandchildren, and now we have, I, don't, I haven't remade the slide because we're just getting them, but we have a fourth generation that's beginning to emerge. The important thing of the study is that um, we used structured interviews. We interviewed the children, and we interviewed the parents about the children. We actually used Joan Kaufman's revision of the Kitty SADS, which had the new diagnoses as diagnostic criteria uh, began to uh, change. Changing diagnostic criteria are really not a great thing for epidemiologic studies that are longitudinal. They're a colossal pain in the neck. Uh, we try to get an advanced copy of DSM-5 because we're just in, the, in doing the sixth wave, so we wanted to be ahead of the curve. And even though I was on the committee, I couldn't get a copy. So we're going to do the best of it. We're going to wait for Joan to do another version with DSM-5. We had clinically experienced and trained interviewers, but all the interviewers were blind to the original proband group. So they didn't know when they were interviewing whether it was an offspring of depressed or an offspring of, from the low-risk families. We had all the uh, interviews uh, diagnosed by a blind, also blind by a psychiatrist or a psychologist who weren't involved in the original uh, interviews, and that led to what is now called the best estimate diagnosis, which is a term that was coined by Jim Lechman, a child psychiatrist at Yale, and is pretty much in the vernacular but it came from this study, the best estimate. Uh, the, the findings have been appeared in many different papers, so I'll just summarize them briefly. Uh, the major findings were that the offspring of the depressed probands had higher rates of depression, but the pattern of onset was the same in both groups, which we thought was interesting. The pattern of onset is starting around age 13, between 13 and about 20 is where you had the peak onset, and, but the rates were always higher. And uh, we find the same thing when we go to the third generation. Uh, the other finding which is relevant to our work was that anxiety disorders began early, and they also were far more elevated in the offspring of the depressed as compared to the normal controls. And this same pattern, this is the second generation uh, divided by the first generation, but when we went to the third generation divided by the first generation, the findings were the same. And that showed very nicely in this slide. Here are the low-risk grandparents. Here are the high-risk grandparents. And if you look at this group, those are the grandchildren that have both a depressed grandparent and a depressed parent. And the average age at this wave was around 12 and a half, and 40% of them had some kind of a mood disorder. So we said, well, there must be something going on there because the third generation didn't necessarily live with the first generation, so it wasn't just uh, they were in close contact. And this summarizes the findings of the study. The increased risk of depression across the generations and the high risk, the anxiety, this first presentation. Substance abuse increased in adulthood, and as the drug of choice changed, our third generation 
abuse the drug of choice. <laughs> but the drug abuse was there in the third generation. And 40% of the grandchildren with uh, two generations affected had a depression by adolescence, not necessarily a full depression, but some kind of a mood disorder. Now, th this was interesting, and we haven't pursued it, but it's sort of consistent with literature which shows the relationship between depression and cardiovascular disease, although the mechanism is not that clear. But the parents, now in their 50s, had increased risk of cardiovascular problems. We didn't do a physical exam, but they said they had been diagnosed by a doctor. So that certainly shows some kind of premature medical comorbidity. Well, then we decided it was enough. We didn't want to just do follow-up studies and show that the findings can are consistent and they're strong, et cetera. We wanted to try to understand the mechanisms, and a lot of this work depends on having excellent collaborators who are interested in your work because it's very hard to suddenly become a neuroimager or a geneticist uh, or a biologist if that's not your training, but to have people who are really interested. So we started to look for endophenotypes, that's brains, brain activity or genes seen in people with an illness that may be present in the biological relatives who are at risk but who are not necessarily ill. So we did MRI, whoops, uh, sorry about that. We did MRI, EEG, that was Jerry Bruder, Brad Peterson, and DNA. One of the things we learned is if we wanted to have these studies funded continually is that we didn't ask for funds to do genetic studies because these samples are very large for imaging studies but very small for genetic studies. And you, can't, you would not be able to get funded easily for a sample of 1,000 or 2,000 MRIs because of the expense. On the other hand, if you're doing genetic studies and you don't have those samples, you're severely criticized. Um, I think that that probably is a mistake because if you have a well-designed study, you may have a specific hypothesis, especially if it's multi-generational. But David Pauls will be speaking next and he can talk about, or may talk about some of that. Now, I wanted to make a point, because this is an epidemiologic perspective, that this high-low risk design is a very good one for biomarkers. If you use a case control study, that is you take patients who are coming into the clinic with a disorder, well diagnosed, and then you take a match control group, you are really only yielding correlates of an illness measured at the end state. And in our studies we find that there are people who have depression but don't have family history and we have people who have control, who are the controls, and they do have family history. And all of that gets mixed in. Now there's ways to get around that, but we thought we had multi-generations and this was really a neat design. And this is what we were looking for as a biomarker, and this comes from Gottesman's work, and uh, I think it's standard. Since there's students in the room who may not have gotten this yet, I uh, decided to put the slide on. But we wanted something that appeared before the illness developed, so we had kids, and we had second and third generation who hadn't gotten ill. And so we know it didn't arise necessarily as a result of the illness. It should be state independent. In other words, it should, we see, should see it in people and family members who've not gotten ill. It should be a trait, a biomarker that's running through. So to show you the, the waves, we had baseline, two-year, 10-year, 20-year, 25-year, and here's where we are right now. And we got bolder and bolder as time went on, and our findings got stronger. And the reason for the, this type of uh, these years of funding is when we got funded. <laughs> so <laughs> but we kept at it. And in the 20-year follow-up, we, int we introduced the EEGs because that was the easiest thing to do. And Jerry Bruder um, was a collaborator. When Brad Peterson arrived at Columbia, we introduced MRI and we 
beg, borrowed, and steal to collect money for DNA, but we didn't get, we didn't ask for funds for it. And now we have, through the, our Conti Center, we're collecting the DNA, because the Conti Center is on serotonergic uh, development. And we're redoing the EEG and the MRI. That's where we are right now. Uh, this is the MRI that we use. Um, well, the first one we use is a 1.5 Tesla. We're now using a 3.5. That's a problem, but there's no way, I don't know, there's no way around it. The first studies were done in New Haven, although we were at Columbia, the sample was in New Haven, so we traipsed down there uh, and used, they have very good facilities, and they had the 1.5, which was the state of the art at that time. I don't quite know how we're going to do test retest with the magnet changing, but we're doing it. Uh, the slides I have are just on the first 131, but we actually have imaging at one point in time in about 220 subjects, and we're about halfway through doing the uh, retest, and we're also collecting new samples as they come. And we looked at uh, cortical thinning. Oh. Not too good at that. Well, I'll show you a brain picture and then just summarize the results. We found that predisposition to familial depression derives from a disturbance of the cortical gray matter in the right cerebral hemisphere, and there was a 30% average reduction in cortical thickness, which is similar to the extent of abnormalities that are found in severe uh, mental illnesses and neuropsychiatric disorders. We found that it was present in persons at high familial risk, whether or not they ever had depression, suggesting that it could be a familial trait marker, and that it was also associated with multiple measures of current, but not lifetime, symptoms, including inattention and visual memory of social stimuli. And this paper was published by Brad Peterson in PNAS. Uh, we have a new sample uh, and about 40 cases with family history and 40 controls without family history, and we're going to see if we can replicate those findings. So these findings are what we have, but they require replication, of course. Uh, we also have another interesting finding. Uh, we got some money from the Templeton Foundation, which I don't know, does any, do people know what the Templeton Foundation is? Well, they support uh, re research that has to do with religion and resilience, and there was somebody in our group who was interested in uh, the effects of religious beliefs and spirituality. And she showed that in the 10-year follow-up that people who, from the high-risk sample, who said they were high, that religion and spirituality was highly important to them, uh, were protected against depression in the 10-year follow-up. We were all very skeptical about these findings, as you are for most environmental uh, factors. But we've, having shown that, and this was independent of, of attendance at church or temple, and uh, having found that, we said, well, let's check the brains. The hypothesis is that uh, people who have uh, who think religion and spirituality is very important should have thicker cortex. And we actually found that, and that's a paper that's in press. And it's also consistent with data that's coming out from Ricky Davidson Lab in Wisconsin about mindfulness and, uh, and also some from the psychotherapy. Now, um, I'll just summarize this quickly because I want to get to some of the others. Uh, we had EEG, and we actually looked for cortical thickness in the MRI because the EEG findings suggested where we might find some abnormalities. So since we had EEG and MRI on about 75 subjects, 
we uh, compared uh, the findings of those two procedures and asked whether thinner cortical mantle translates into less cortical activity. And we actually found a significant correlation between uh, <coughs> alpha asymmetry and cortical thickness. And it was strongest in the areas where we saw it on the MRI. Now, again, that has to be replicated. But I think it's very important because if MRI becomes a biomarker, that is a totally impractical one because it would be at least $500 for everybody to go through and, uh, and determine whether they had the real depression. I think we need something. An EEG would be more viable. How much time do I have? So, 12 minutes. I think I'll skip this part then, the genetics, because I want to get to, I'll just show you the, well, this is the, the one finding that we had that uh, as far as the S alleles, we had a hypothesis that we should find a higher percent of people who are homozygote for the S alleles in the high versus the low risk, and that this would be related to depression. Well, it wasn't related to depression, but we did find that the rate was of the S alleles was much stronger in the high versus the low risk. So as ep an epidemiologist, we said, well, well, is this too high or is this too low? And there was a paper published by Clark, which had about 35 studies in a meta-analysis looking at the rates of, of the S alleles. And also they found it wasn't related to depression as we did too. But what we found was that the rates of the S alleles in the high risk group were comparable to general population. So in point of fact, it's not the high risk that's so interesting, it's really the low risk and why they were depleted. And we saw depletion as they went through the generations. We're now uh, looking at a larger sample in this and it's just work in progress. And this was our, is our hypothesis that uh, low risk families may be genetically resilient and the high-risk families, in con contrast, may carry the same genetic susceptibility as the general population, but they're exposed to more stress. So that would make stress really a very interesting thing to study. And there's a lot of controversy about Caspi's findings on life events and the S allele, but I don't think it's a hypothesis that should be given up. Now, I want to end because I want to just show what you can do with these kind of data. Um, we said, you know, it's about time we did something for somebody rather than just studying them. So how do we modify risk factors? Well, you can't change a child's genetics, or at least you can't now, and you can't change their family, but you can treat a parent and maybe help the offspring. So we wanted interventions based on a modifiable risk factor. And we argued well, there is one study going on, I won't go into that, in which we, actually, this is Brad Peterson, who's following the offspring of depressed parents with cortical thinning. But this is the study I'm going to show you. The successfully treating depressed mothers may help their offspring reduce symptoms. Because, in fact, what you're doing is removing a stress from the child. This was our rationale. If depression is a complex genetic disorder, and may be precipitated by stress, what could be more stressful for a child than having a depressed parent? So we wanted to know whether the children would benefit from a remission in their parents' depression, and we designed this study. This was STAR-D, which is a very famous, well-known study of 4,000 people that had rather poor remission rates at the end of three months. About 35 people were uh, patients went into remission, but the purpose of the study was to do an effectiveness study mimicking clinical practice and to try to get the patients into remission, and at the end of three months, if that didn't work, to try other medications. Uh, so in this study, the mothers were treated for depression, and mothers outcome was entirely independent from us. There was an entirely different team. And we studied their children. We followed them over time. 
and we looked at the child outcomes, and they were assessed by clinicians not providing mother's treatment, blind to the mother's clinical status. When the depressed parents entered into treatment, a third of their children were currently ill with depression, anxiety, or conduct disorder, and half of them had a history. This is very much like when we looked at the children of depressed parents, very similar. And this were the results at the end of three months. If the mother remitted, there was a change in the child's diagnosis, and if the mother didn't remit, the children either didn't change or got worse. Uh, the Wall Street Journal really liked this, helping kids beat depression by treating the mom. My children brought me a t-shirt that said, if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> uh, these results, uh, we looked at it at six months to one year, and we found, as we might expect, that the earlier the, child's rem the mother's remission, the better it was for the child, but even those who had Mothers had a later remission, the children got better, and the results in the children were sustained one year after remission. Uh, we didn't have funding for more than that. And poor single mothers and their children had the lowest rates of remission, and also their children did less well, suggesting that there are other factors going into the child's uh, non-well-being uh, in addition to the mother's uh, clinical status. Now, we only studied mothers because Fathers have lower rates of depression, and it's very difficult to get them into treatment. We have, this was an observational study. It's not a controlled clinical trial, therefore it was criticized. The, we can't say that mother's remission and child's outcome is related to treatment. It could have been related to her winning the lottery. Uh, so to say it's related to treatment, you have to do a controlled clinical trial, and we have just finished one using medication and, uh, we're working on it, but I think the results will be positive, but I can't say which medications. Now, uh, these are other high-risk studies that are going on. I'm sure there's others that I don't know about, and I think these are uh, a gold mine of potential for translational epidemiology. And I just end with this from Michael Rutter, who was one of my heroes that it's a great mistake, mistake to see translation simply in applying at the bedside the findings of basic science. The Drosophila do not tell you that much directly about a person who's in the bed. Many of the pathways start with clinical or epidemiologic studies and not with basic science, and an even greater proportion involve a complex iterative interplay between the two. And that's, I think, the most promising and the most exciting when you can go back and forth with collaborators. These pathways extend over many decades, and there is much need for hypothesis-based bridging studies that occupy a crucial path, pathway, but are not the end point. And I'll end with that. Thank you. Professor Weisman, thank you very much for your brilliant presentation. Uh, we are really tight on schedule, so we're going to open up for one or two quick questions. I could, couldn't have been that clear. <laughs> uh, congratulations. It was wonderful stuff and beautiful data. Thank you. Uh, I have several questions, but one, one that came uh, to my mind is, uh, so in this study that you, you, you're seeing the effect of treatment in, in the kids, the, the mothers were all treated and randomized to different drugs, is it correct? No, in this study they all received uh, citalopram in the first, that was the design of the STAR-D. Uh -huh. And then if they didn't remit, they then had they were randomized. Uh, randomized, but they could choose, it was very complicated, they could choose within classes of drugs. So they were on multiple medications. The end point was remission. Perfect. But we're going to be doing a... We yeah, that, doing that's a what I was going <laughs> to yeah. ask you. So what's the design of this new, new study? Uh, the new study has uh, three drugs, citalopram, bupropion, and the combination. 
and we're looking at the effects on the children. And okay. it's very interesting. And it's only drugs as well. It's only drugs. Because that, that's a good opportunity for a psychosocial intervention, isn't it? Of course. There is yeah. one psychosocial intervention. It's very hard to get funding for psychosocial interventions in the United States. Um, but there is one, a small study that was done by Holly Schwartz in Pittsburgh, published in the American Journal of Psychiatry, in which she looked at interpersonal psychotherapy versus treatment as usual, 47 patients, kids. And she showed that um, if the effects of IPT were seen at three months in the mothers and at nine months was strong in the children. There was a delayed effect. Um, and that's, that's it. There's a few other clinical trials, but they, they had trouble recruiting. It is very difficult to recruit depressed mothers with children into studies. Yeah. Because uh, my hypothesis would be that the so-called social intervention, the mothers could incorporate some, some strategies that th sh they could teach the children as well. That's just uh, well, there's some findings from our study that's still being written up, which suggests where, what could be done, because we see some of the factors that are affected in the mothers that maybe psychotherapy would enhance. But since it's very easy to get pharmacotherapy in the United States and very difficult to get psychotherapy, and we want to see kids get better, we're happy to have something that works, even though we develop psychotherapy. <laughs>